Hello, welcome back to my channel. This video is all about understanding the tricky sign convention for shear force and shear stress. Okay, this is a chronic perpetual problem for students learning this material for the first time. Okay, so we use capital V for shear force. And we're looking at force on a plane and our positive convention is that the plane on the left tends to move up while the plane on the right tends to move down, okay? Another way to think about this, and this is one I usually, I don't teach it this way because I feel like this adds to the confusion, but if you've landed on my channel and you're um, being taught this by someone else, they may have told you that a shear force that tends to rotate the body clockwise is positive, and we see that that is indeed true, but that sign convention, or it, I mean, that way to remember it is not successful from a teaching perspective. So the way that I teach it is the plane on the right tends to move up while the plane on the left tends to move down. Leave it at that. All right, we're going to use a towel for shear stress. Stress, of course, being force per area, because we know we can take a shear stress, multiply times the dA, integrate over the area, and get back to shear force, right? So here are units in that are like in uh, newtons and kilonewtons and pounds and kips, things like this. My shear stresses are in units like megapascals or KSI or PSI, those type of units. All right, and our shear stress has a different sign convention. It goes like this. This is X, this is Y. A stress on the positive X face in the positive Y direction is positive. Note that these vectors are pointing in different directions. Okay, so shear force happens at a plane. Shear stress is what's happening at a point and you cannot mix these up, and I get that they're tricky, okay? Um, that one is a positive shear stress. This is a positive shear stress on the positive Y plane, positive X direction. That one is a positive shear stress. Negative Y plane, negative Y X direction. That one is a positive shear stress, okay? So this is the tricky, tricky sign convention that this problem is intended to help you think through. All right, I'm going to do, let me do a little selection of all this stuff and just get it off of my image, cut, paste. Okay, we'll just turn that one off and work here. All right. All right, now that we know the purpose of the video, let's get into the actual problem. So we do have a simply supported beam. That's what we're seeing here. It carries a point load P at mid span. Mid span just means halfway across. So we have L over two and L over two. Um, we've got two different cross-sectional planes cut. So plane AA and BB have been cut. And then we've got points A and B sitting there right at mid-depth. So there is one piece of information that is not explicitly stated in the problem. But we are going to assume that this cross-section is um, symmetric. So in other words, this dashed line that I'm drawing here, that's my axis of bending or actually neutral surface would be the best way to refer to it in this particular view. But basically all that means is that Y bar is here, that H minus Y bar is here, and that both of those are equal to the same thing, C, in other words, that each one of these distances, let's see how I can do this without just making it more confusing, um, is equal to h over two, OK? 
Okay, so just halfway, halfway through the depth or at mid depth, that is our neutral surface. I'm going to line that up and points A and B both line up to that surface. The reason why I set the problem up this way is so that we could focus on shear stress without having to think about flexural stress due to the presence of a bending moment. All right, so there's basically two parts to the problem. We want to construct free bodies that cut through these two planes. So cut through this plane, we'll look at this free body. Cut through that plane, we'll look at that free body. Then illustrate the what's happening at points A and B. And so we can see the relationship between shear force, V, shear stress, tau, and also get into that tricky sign convention that is such a pitfall for students that are starting to study mechanics for the first time. All right, what I am going to do, I will start off unsurprisingly with a free body diagram. I want to take this body and I want to free it or release it from its support. So it's going to look kind of like that to a copy merged edit paste and we'll put that right here and what we're actually doing of course in this free body is taking those bolts out there's a bolt that connects the beam to the pin roller on the left there's a bolt that connects the beam to the pin roll on the right i'll draw that in a solid color right so there's a through bolt here making this connection some type of solid cylinder and then i'm just taking those out so at the bottom we truly have uh, voids all right let's put this puppy into static equilibrium this is a beam we've seen so many times before so hopefully the idea that we're going to take half of the load to the left, half to the right, and that both of those are equal to P over 2 is something that should be pretty self-evident by now. Now, I am going to do this with free bodies, but I also want to do the shear and moment diagrams. Don't, uh, don't skip ahead. I promise to be quick. I promise, promise, promise to be quick. I want to go ahead and do those because I want to make sure that you understand when we do shear and moment diagrams what those actually mean in the context of a free body cut. Okay. All right. So we're going to put our shear diagram here and we will put our moment diagram there. I will label both of those. So V for shear. And we don't need units because this whole problem is symbolic. So I'll just put a V for shear there, M for bending moment there. Let's do our shear diagram first. I'm going to use orange for that. Start at zero, increase up to P over two, plateau across. Halfway across, we get to P, decrease by P. That lands me at minus P over two, which in turn I'll increase by that amount once I get to the right support. Okay, so there is our beam. And I can color that in as well. Okay, let's get into the moment diagram. So we definitely want to start at zero, end at zero. We don't have any applied moments or reacting moments, so we can just straight up integrate the shear diagram graphically. I want to increase to a peak here. That's equal to the, or the change in value of moments equal to the area under the shear curve. So that will be P times, um, I better write it out, I better write it out. So this area under the curve, it's got a base of L over 2, it's got a height of P over 2, so we get PL over 4 for that area, and that is absolutely equal to this value of moment, PL over 4 right there. All right, decrease back to 0, do so linearly, and now we have a moment diagram. I will fill that one with color as well and then I will simply turn down the volume on that layer so that we can get a little more in detail about what it is that we're doing here. Okay so we know the sign convention for bending moment. All of these areas up here above the line that is an in I'm sorry 
I misspoke. I'm going to say that again. The sign convention for shear force, everything above that line, has this tendency to shear. Each two neighboring planes that are separated by a little differential dx, the one on the left tends to move up while the other one tends to move down. That is my sign convention for shear force, not shear stress, but shear force. Conversely, all of these cross-sectional planes, everything over on the right, that is a negative shear force. So we could cartoon that as for each dx slice over the right half of the beam, the left plane tends to move down relative to the right plane, which tends to move upward. These are relative and not absolute moments. Okay. Get that out of there, up, down, and then down, up. That is what our shear force diagrams show. Now, what I am going to do, I'm going to be sneaky, sneaky here. I know I'm going to be interested in plane AA in a minute, so I'm just going to move those arrows so that they go right over this plane. And here, with this one's BB, so I'm going to move those arrows so that they a little bit kind of rotated there. They are right there telling us exactly what's happening at that plane. Okay, we'll get back to that in a minute. Now, bending moment, what does that mean? We've got positive bending moment, so our beam is smiling at us, concave up curvature due to the presence of an internal bending moment that is positive. Okay, so there's a little context. Let's go ahead and do our free body diagrams. And we'll do them straight up, and then I want to make sure that you understand the relationship between what is going on there and these shear and moment diagrams. So my first one that I'm going to take, I'm going to take, um, I'm going to get a rectangular tool right here, and I just want to cut this little piece of the beam. Okay. A little copy of that chunk, put it over here. Okay. Now, how do I put this in equilibrium? I'm looking at the context. What I have done to go from this to this are two things. I have disconnected it from the roller. So I might need to make sure that P over 2 comes to the party. That's my reaction. That is the force of the connection on the body. The body is the beam. The other thing I did is I cut it right there. So let's make our cut symbol. And now let's place that into static equilibrium. Now, as so many things in this class and engineering in general and learning new things in general, right? There's multiple ways to do this. The way that I would do this if left to my own devices is as follows. In my head, I would look at the summation of forces in the y direction as equal to zero. And I would note that for static equilibrium, I need a shear force downward equal and opposite to that P over two. I would then say, okay, I'm still not in equilibrium for a moment or for the tendency to rotate. And I know from the context up, the, up there that the cut plane is located a quarter way across the entire span or L over four. I'll go ahead and add that to my drawing just to make sure that that's clear. So this distance is L over four. And so now I need an internal bending moment and I need it to be in this direction because I'm summing moments about that point, the axis coming out of the page. The reaction tends to rotate the body clockwise. So therefore, my internal moment better rotated equal and opposite or counterclockwise. The magnitude for that moment, I just take the product of P over 2 and L over 4. P times L in the numerator, 2 times 4 gives me an 8 in the denominator. Okay, that is the way I would solve that if left to my own devices. However, I'm going to move this to the side so that we have a record of what I did. But as you are learning this, this is what I recommend. Draw your shear force in the positive direction. Up on the left, that one doesn't show up on this free body, but down 
on the right sure does. Call that your positive shear force. Draw your bending moment in the positive direction. Okay, that's the sign convention down here. That one is a positive bending moment. Then write out the equation, summation of forces, not the x, that the y direction is equal to zero, p over two, upwards plus sign, v downwards minus sign equals zero. Therefore, v is equal to p over two. We got a positive result, which tells me that direction is correct. That's exactly what we did in the more intuitive way first, okay? Moments, summation of moments about the cut is equal to zero. I'm summing about the axis that's coming out of the page at that giant blue dot. Okay, how many terms do I have? I've got P over 2. The distance for that one is L over 4. That one is going to be clockwise or negative. I don't have to deal with my shear force because it's in the plane of the cut. It's coincident with the point about which I'm summing my moments, but I do need that internal bending moment. So in the positive direction, that becomes a positive counterclockwise term plus m is equal to zero. Therefore, m is equal to PL over eight. I do get a positive sign and that corresponds to that. These signs are super duper tricky. You have to work with them and think carefully. So it is so, so easy, so, so, so easy to get these signs wrong. That's an important concept. So like getting the numbers right, but being like, yeah, got a 50-50 chance of getting the sign right. Um, that's a big deal. All right, so I'm just going to remove all this. I'm going to remove this and just kind of put back my solution. OK, so these are showing my internal shear force, my internal bending moment drawn um, in the actual direction happens to be the positive direction and leaving it at that. Let's do the other free body. So I'm going to come back over here to the context and I'm going to cut through the fibers at plane BB and I'm going to pop that bolt, detach from the right support, copy and paste that and I'll just put it right there. So I have another free body. I need to put it in equilibrium. So what do I need to do? Well, I detached it from the support. I know the support exerts a force of P over two upward. So of course I need that in my free body diagram. I also sliced through the material through that plane. So I'm gonna get internal shear and bending moment. And this one I'm gonna do by inspection. So watch this carefully. Due to summation of forces in the y direction is equal to zero. I know the shear force in that plane is downward P over two. How about my bending moment? I want some moments about this point. Recall that, recall that the geometry that's given tells me that the length of this free body is also L over four. So it's the, the other quarter point, the three quarter point. And as I sum moments about that axis, um, I need an internal moment that goes clockwise to balance out the tendency of the body to rotate counterclockwise due to the P over two reaction. Okay, P over two times L over four is PL over eight. So we get the same number there, okay, but a different direction. All right, are these two free bodies in static equilibrium? And the answer is yes, they are. Get rid of this and we can start to answer the rest of the problem. So what have we done so far? We took a trip down uh, shear and moment diagram memory lane and then we made these cuts. So these cuts are the answers to these problems. Are they the only answers? Absolutely not. There's other ways we could do that. We could, I mean, all it does is says that cut through these planes. That means that I could have just taken this free body right here and put it in equilibrium. And that would also be a correct answer. Here's what that would look like. I would need to keep my P force here. I figured out these, so I just flip them for the other side of the same plane. So it would be P over two up. PL over eight this way. Over at this plane, I already solved for those, but I just flip the sense. So P over two up, PL over eight that way. So this would also be a correct answer to the prompt. So if you're watching these videos and you've solved the problem a different way, 
there are many, many times when there are multiple correct answers to my homework sets. Okay, as long as you're answering the questions that are given, it's not that there's one correct answer. Oftentimes there's not. All right, but we did this little task and here's the million dollar concept that I want to make sure that you understand. Okay, listen carefully. See how our shear diagram for plane AA said that the tendency was that the plane on the left moves up while the plane on the right moves down. That's our internal positive shear force. Do you see that same pattern here? In other words, let's see how I can do this. I'm going to add a layer. I'm going to put some white color in that layer. And then I'll just kind of dim it a little bit. So I want it to fade into the background. Okay. And I'll add a layer on top. Okay. And I'll zoom in here. Do you see? This is the million dollar concept. Okay. So right here at the plane that contains point A. So there is a cut. I could take a little differential DX slice right there. Right, so this is my DX slice. I'm taking the limit as that DX goes to zero to really see what's happening at plane AA. On the right side, this is the one we just solved. So I've still got P over two shear, PL over eight moment. I don't have any load on this part of the beam, so I wouldn't show that there. And on the other side, let's put it in equilibrium. So now I need P over two upward, okay? And I need for moment equilibrium, a PL over eight right there, okay? So this is a way when I wanna make sure that you know in this video tutorial, is that when you take these free bodies, pay attention to whether you're cutting on the positive X side or the negative X side, make these connections between this picture here that we have just drawn and what is going on in the shear diagram. You see that right there? That is the same shear as is in that shear diagram. And of course, the pattern's the same for bending moment. So if I come down here, see those two rotations? They're matching these. Okay, so we're matching this, matching that at plane AA. That is kind of the big picture million dollar concept that I wanted to make sure that you understood. I think I'm gonna put that little wedge back in place because I think I'm gonna use it here in a minute. So let me get it back to where it was. Put it a little bigger. Do, 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 do. Thank you for your patience. You are awesome. All right, I think that's close enough. We'll just leave it right there. Turn it off. Come back to that a little bit later. I'll turn off my masking layer and kind of actually maybe I'll turn that one back on. Okay. All right. All right. Now we're going to make a pivot. I want to illustrate the state of stress at points A and points B. So I'm gonna zoom back into this plane right here. And now I'm going to a point. I'm going to a point. I will draw a square to represent a point. The center of the point is right there on the neutral axis, on the axis of bending. I'm gonna label this That was really weird. Let me do that again. Sorry about that. I'm going to label that point A. And let's think about what stresses are going to happen. I have a bending moment. Is that going to cause a flexural stress at A? Let's think about it. If I asked you about the point on the top, you'd be like, yeah, that gets a compressive stress. Or the point on the bottom, you'd say, yeah, that gets a tension stress. But if it's right in the middle, that one is stress equals zero. So my flexural stress is going to be equal to zero at that point. Now let's do my shear stresses. And this is the easy epic maneuver. All you have to do is this. I'm going to move this out of the way. 
figure out the direction of your internal shear force and then just shrink it down and turn that into a shear stress. Okay, so the shear stress and the shear force have to go in the same direction because, because a shear stress multiplied by an area has to, or integrated over an area, you have to get a shear force out of that. Okay, stay tuned for just a second. I'll pop this layer back on right there. Maybe turn that one down so it's not overly confusing. Go back to our stress element and we'll do the same thing over on the left, right? So we've got this internal shear force V on the plane of the cross section, but now I wanna put that down at the point, at the point itself. So we just mimic the same direction. Okay, so point with the arrows, the arrows are what makes sense here. Our sign conventions is where this gets hairy because if I asked you, what is the sign convention of these shear forces? You'd say shear force is positive up down. And if we looked at the shear stresses, first of all, I need two more to put this in equilibrium, right? Whenever you have one shear stress, you actually have four. When I look at my shear stresses at a tau, and I said, what's the sign of that? You'd say shear stress is negative because my shear stress on the positive x face is down, not up. Okay. And of course, this is still in play here. So we'll just show that by not including that. Okay. Thanks for hanging in here with this video. <laughs> I just want to make sure you understand. So I saw, I'm, I do apologize that some of them get a little bit long. I really want you to understand the material and do well. That's my only motivation, not to make you waste as much time on YouTube as possible. Okay, let's turn that masking layer off. And this is how we would show that solution. If you were asked to illustrate the state of stress at A, you would just zoom into that point and essentially draw that, not like that. You would essentially draw, let's try that one more time, a picture that looks like that. Only thing that's missing are your axes, so be sure to include those. Those are important. They're important now, but when we get into 3D, they'll be more important. And that is your answer. That is your illustration of the state of stress at points A and B. The trick is to either make the cut, figure out that direction and match it, or figure out the same information just by doing your shear diagram. Okay, I'll pick up the pace for the last one now that we see the pattern. The second one should be super easy, so I'll open that one up, turn that off, zoom in here. Let's illustrate the state of stress at point B. I make a square. The square is our symbol for a point in space. When I'm dealing with multiple points, I usually label them so I don't get them confused. And again, I'm on the neutral axis. So do I have any flexural stress minus MY or I? Uh, let me write that down. Do I have any flexural stress minus MY over I? And the answer is no way because I'm on the axis of bending. So I don't need to deal with flexural stress. This problem has been designed to focus on shear stress. All I do is look at the direction of that shear force and match it up to the right plane. For my shear stress, once I know one direction of shear stress, I know there are three other ones and I know the pattern for equilibrium. I need those stresses to make my point in equilibrium with respect to force equilibrium and moment equilibrium. Last but not least, in order to report this as your answer, all I'm going to do is blow it up in size. So let's make that one about as big as the other, pull it off to the side like this. And the one thing that we're missing is our coordinate system. So again, give these things a coordinate system and that answers the question for what is happening at point B. Okay, you'll note again that pattern 
of the down up arrow matching the down up of our shear diagram, you would simply call this a negative internal shear force, while we would call this a positive shear stress force over area tau because the arrow on the positive x face is pointing in the positive y direction. Okay, long video. One other thing, just make sure this is crystal, crystal clear. I'll zoom in to back to point A. And I just want to make sure you understand in 3D what's happening. So we draw this stuff in 2D, but we think about it in 3D. So this is a 3D view of the state of stress at A. I definitely need my coordinate system. So I'm going to put X going that way, Y going that way, Z going that way. Match that up to the picture of the beam above. Here is how I would interpret these vectors. On the positive x face, I need the negative y direction. There's the positive x face. This is the negative y direction. That is a tau. Why does it go from single arrowhead to double arrowhead? Well, on this picture, this stress lives in that plane. But if I tried to draw it right there, we wouldn't be able to see it, see it very well. So by convention, we move it over slightly. And then we use the single arrowhead to convey that the distance here is actually 0. Just a little symbology convention thing. OK, here's the one on the top, positive y face negative x direction. There's the positive y face and here is the negative x direction. That one also is a tau. There's of course two others on the bottom face but we typically would not draw them. I will dash them in for teaching purposes but anyone that understands the language of solid mechanics knows those other two ones are there even when you cannot see them in our stress cube. Okay, so stress element here, stress cube here, same ideas though. So even though you're drawing this in 2D, don't lose sight of what is happening in 3D with all of its glory. Long video, thanks for tuning in. I hope this is helpful. I know this stuff is really hard and it seems simple. Um, so I hope that this has helped you slam the door on this particular concept and um, that you got it. Have a great day. Thanks for tuning in. Bye.